You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lemire. Do you believe you have commitment issues? Why do we sabotage ourselves? And how can we overcome analysis paralysis so that we can start taking meaningful action today. In this excerpt from This Book Will Make You Dangerous, I'm going to share the reasons why we hit the brakes when we're trying to make a positive change, and we'll also begin to understand the invisible force of resistance so that it doesn't keep us stuck. If you're interested in the book, you can learn more by visiting DangerousBookstore.com. Every so often, someone will interview me for their podcast so we can discuss why men do this and why men do that in relationships. I can't pretend to speak for all men, but inevitably I get asked some kind of question like, why won't a man commit? And my response is usually, it's because he's already committed. He's committed to a sense of comfort. He's committed to a sense of safety. He's committed to his need to look good, to be accepted in his community. And if he thinks that, quote, committing to a certain relationship may threaten these things, well, then he's going to resist. And this is true for all of us, and it's true for basically anything in our lives, not just relationships. Whether we're conscious of this commitment or not, it's there all the time. And if we can't seem to understand why we're stuck, why we're having a hard time committing to a new behavior, a new way of eating, an exercise program, or a relationship, then I'm going to put my money on the idea that in some way we believe that new thing, no matter how obviously good it may be for us, is somehow a threat to our sense of comfort, safety, or self-image. This means our fears will defend living in a way that keeps us feeling trapped, drained, isolated, overwhelmed, or bored out of our minds. I have to do this draining work or else my entire life will fall apart. I'm trapped in this lousy relationship because I don't want to be the bad guy and leave. I'm forced to take on all these overwhelming responsibilities or else I'll look like a failure if I go backwards. From this perspective, we can see that there are no commitment phobes because we're already committed to our survival, our, quote, success, so to speak. Harvard faculty member Dr. Lisa Laskow Leahy and psychologist Dr. Robert Keegan call this our competing commitment, and we would be foolish to expect to make any significant change in our lives without addressing these underlying commitments first. Why? Because when we don't own our competing commitments, they end up sabotaging us. Like that some bitch, nasty, one-eyed, periscope, snorkel creature in the trash compactor from the movie Star Wars. It lurks underneath the surface and then, whoop, grabs our ankle and pulls us back under when we least expect it. If we're going to lie on our deathbed with any regrets, our regrets will have resistance to thank. So let's stay aware of our commitment to comfort and safety and acceptance. Let's expect resistance to try and convince us that a tiny speed bump is really a wall. The first step is to learn how to identify resistance. And to do that, we can just take a look at our excuses. One common way to tell if we've been hijacked by resistance is if we hear ourselves say something like, whoa, 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 wait a second, this is uncomfortable. Something must be wrong. I better wait until this discomfort goes away. I better figure out why I'm uncomfortable. This one goes out to all of us who suffer from analysis paralysis. It points to a belief that discomfort is somehow unnatural. Well, consider this scenario. We're at the gym working out, but after a few reps, we start to experience this weird burning sensation in our muscles. What the hell's going on? This can't be right. What if we were convinced that this discomfort meant that something was wrong? Those that are committed to being stronger and more mobile understand that this tension is merely the physical sensation of their muscles growing and stretching. It's part of the process. They expect the discomfort. They know it doesn't mean something's wrong, even though it may be intense at times. But what happens when we begin to feel that emotional intensity? What about that voice that says, we better stop, this feels uncomfortable? It's resistance. Resistance just means we're moving outside of our comfort zone. It's a universal, natural response to experience this discomfort. It's also a universal, natural response for us to try to find really compelling, convincing reasons not to do the things we want to do, because we don't want to feel that discomfort. Resistance is committed to keeping us within our comfort zone, even if we're not happy there. And it'll do whatever it can to grab that wheel and steer us into a ditch. 
So instead of getting stuck in analysis paralysis, we want to remember that discomfort doesn't mean that anything is necessarily wrong. Be curious about it? Sure. Let it control our lives or wait until it gives us permission to move forward? Not unless we want to be miserable. We can learn to find our sweet spot with this discomfort. We don't have to be overwhelmed or crippled with stress because we've taken on too much. And we certainly don't have to stay stuck because we're avoiding it either. We don't even have to analyze or try to figure out why we have resistance. Instead, we can simply ask ourselves, what's the very next simple step I could take? And then go do it. Let's see if it makes us stronger. Let's move on to the next excuse. If I make a big change, everything will fall apart. Let's explore another very common scenario I encounter when I'm coaching. I talk to so many clients that have big dreams and even bigger excuses. They paint a wonderful picture for themselves and then hit a wall because they believe they'll have to do something reckless or dramatic that would endanger their family or lifestyle. It's usually some story about having to quit their job or get a divorce or raise vast amounts of cash before they could even get started creating the thing they want to build. With the stakes so seemingly high, we can grind to a halt because of our fear of failure or even the fear of success. Regardless, it's some belief that making this change means some huge, terrible thing will happen. But what if these doomsday scenarios are really just another scary, made-up monster under our bed? Most of the time, this kind of thing is just resistance, and convincing ourselves that the next step is reckless or dangerous is a highly effective way to rationalize staying in our comfort zone for years. But when I walk through these nightmares with clients, most of the time we come to realize they're just fantasies. In reality, the next step isn't drastic. It's usually quite small, benign, or mundane. Our ego may want to believe that we're the hero who has to slay some big dragon, but what's more true is that we're just a person facing an uncomfortable conversation, phone call, or task. There is no dragon. Here's an example. I once worked with a guy who told me he had this huge burning desire to start his own real estate investment company, but by gosh, he just couldn't figure out why he wasn't moving forward. I asked him, what do you think needs to happen before you can move forward? He said, well, I would need to quit my job, and before I can do that, I need to have X amount in the bank so my family's okay, and man, I'm just not saving it quickly enough. It's going to take years at this rate. I said, okay, well, tell me this. What's the first thing you would do after you had all of that money saved up and knew your family was safe and you quit your job? He thought about it for a while, and then he said, well, I'd reach out to some mentors and start figuring out how to create this investment deal. I'd research how to make it work for them, that kind of thing. And I said, and do you really need to quit your job in order to do that? Huh, I guess not. If resistance has us believing that we need to quit our job or sell our business or have a ton of money in the bank before we can do the thing we really want to do, then let's first imagine we've already done those things. Let's put ourselves in that situation mentally. Now, if this were true, what would be the very next practical step we'd take? What we're likely to see is that this step is not dependent upon our professional or financial or relational situation. We can see that this step is within reach today. And while it may be a little scary, it's something we can do right now. I hope you've enjoyed this excerpt from my new book, This Book Will Make You Dangerous. If you'd like to learn more about the book, then just visit DangerousBookstore.com. Thanks for listening.